afternoon everybody uh, it is uh, nice to be here uh, to share some of the work we are doing in this uh, decarbonization field and uh, i am satinder uh, to provide some information the main points i am uh, looking at today is providing information about drivers for decarbonization then uh, how alternate fuels are uh, happening some of the cases uh, which we are working with various clients and uh, the competence management which is a very critical part uh, that is uh, some of the items to share so as everybody knows that driver for decarbonization starts uh, from IMO MEPC 80 and 81 and that marching orders are on and we need to reduce emissions and we need to go back to uh, our operations how can we do it like uh, we have heard we can do it in a number of uh, different ways uh, the, and of course uh, the favorite question is always why should we do it so there are three important parts here one is of course regulations and policies and companies have their own ESG goals which are driving it then banks are not going to give loan to which don't have a green roadmap basically and then uh, uh, banks are asking us to evaluate ship owners and ship owners are asking us uh, give me a green uh, assessment and then which I can go to bank to take loans so that is a new thing and value chain requirement coming from the charters who also have their green goals they want to achieve and they want they, they will be on lookout for ships with greener credentials so those are the items and then of course EU ETS uh, fuel EU then regional uh, items where they will, you will be required to do the uh, carbon uh, accounting. So there are a number of ways which are uh, we tend to summarize in uh, because uh, uh, as an advisory part coming from the DNV uh, which is different from classification society, we advise the owners how can you optimize operations, how can you save fuel and what you can do even uh, without doing any investment. So you can amend your operational measures, you can uh, change the ship technically and uh, then there are some commercial and logistical uh, decisions you can take with charters or you can adopt alternative fuels. So some of those, this is uh, coming from our Energy Transition Outlook 2023 report uh, where we summarize that these are the measures which has been adopted by various clients and they have got positive results and for other people to follow so the first one like it was just mentioned speed reduction is a one of the very effective method of reducing your fuel consumption because there is no reason to speed up because the full world fleet is doing that and actually you don't get anything out of it by doing this because uh, eventually charter is going to pay the same amount of money so without really sacrificing your financial returns you can still enhance the climate but the question here is are we all moving together so that is a question mark uh, some charters are not even talking about it so that is a it means we are all not on the same train to reach decarbonized world so this is a, a challenge which needs to be sorted out then uh, of course we can do a hydrodynamic changes because uh, traditionally the ships are produced in a I would call it in a not a very uh, efficient manner because yards have fixed hull lines to offer to owners and owners have only fixed amount to buy the ship if I say today I want to buy a, a dream ship with a minimum energy consumption nobody is going to give me because it does not exist yard is not going to change for me for him take it or leave it number two fixed price ships am i ready to spend 20 million more to buy a green ship answer is no third problem if i want to buy a ship let us meet in 27 or 28 so what are we going to do so we are going to live with this problem then we have a problem of this hydrodynamics because ships were given to us which were not energy efficient and now owners have to spend money even on a two-year-old ship because we analyze and tell them look you have got a lousy ship because it burns the fuel like hell and hull lines are not optimized 
but you can't do it much. You can maybe change the bulbous bow, or I can tell you to do something with machinery, then you can save some money. So that is a challenge, that is the reality. We have never started with a good point. And what is the life of a ship? 20 years. You have to live with it until it goes to the grave. So this is uh, also a thing which we, we have not thought of, that how and why we have to work together. Yards, ship owners, charterers, IMO, and I don't know how many people have to sit together to find a solution. So this is not a, 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 a means uh, at ground level, the things are grim, actually. Then you have a machinery optimization. And again, we are telling owners to derate the engines. Then they say, what are you talking? Because the yacht gave me this ship, because that time ship owner said, I will operate this vessel at 17 knots or 15 knots. And charter is saying, can you go at 12 knots? As an engineer, you said this is totally ridiculous to me because I bought a ship to run at 15 knots and you want me to run at 12 knots, so how can I save? So this is again an issue. So it means we did not design the ship well. So how can you reduce your emission? So there are a number of challenges which are all moving against each other. Then we come to use alternative fuels. But already the ship is designed badly. Alternative fuels can only give you certain, uh, uh, what you call, savings, not so much. So it is a whole thing has to go together, but we have to live with it because we have the ships to operate. We can't just say, okay, delete everything, let us start new. But we have to run the world trade and economy is depending on shipping and it has to go all together. So it is a transition in progress. For future, of course, we will have like carbon capture technology and we are talking about uh, how to save that and minimize the greenhouse gas emissions. So those are the items or challenges which will be there for us to do. But for the topic of alternative fuels, that is a, another one big challenge because uh, we want to go to net zero by 2050. Then by that, we need to have a 92% decline in emissions. And in that decarbonized world of 2050, the oil share will be less than 1%, then only you can reach to that, what we want to achieve by 1.5 degree thing. So this is a, some of the things, but what can you do practically? So this is again a one of the DNV study for pathway to net zero, which is uh, again available publicly to download. But here it is predicted that in order to achieve, you need to have higher energy efficiencies, uh, different fuel mix, new fuels for the low carbon sources, and there will be a diverse fuel mix, not one will do that. And if you look at the data of the ships being ordered, it is moving in that direction. How much is the word, field, uh, uh, word fleet in operation on order and new contract in last month? You can see this figure is changing quite drastically. Starting with 10 now, currently it is almost 18% in the last one year, the ships ordered are on the uh, dual fuel. Different type of ships, what type of thing? This data is from alternative fuel insights. So where it can be tracked that how many ships of which fuel are being ordered. So simple answer is methanol and LNG is leading the pack as of now with the ammonia coming up very big way in the last, almost last 12 months, we have about 20 to 25 orders uh, in the, uh, which is going to be delivered by 26, 27. But will they be a ammonia powered vessels or ammonia ready or will the engines be ready is this some question mark which we still have to see but of course engine manufacturers are saying we will have the engines by that time so if you look at it that availability part regulatory compliance technical considerations and business case has to work together for a owner to decide about yes i can use it today to order the ship to run on alternative fuel but they have a number of questions to answer so we help them to make the decision based on certain elements of rules like we say that for ammonia and for hydrogen we don't have the rules yet and uh, for methanol we have only interim guidelines so these are the things has to be considered but going by the experience of lng as a fuel if those four principles of safeties are being thought of to be replicated to ensure safety for other fuels so those are the four parts segregation double barriers leakage detection and automatic isolation of leakages. So what we are trying to say, we will not allow the fuel to come out of anywhere so that it does not go to the uh, seafarers uh, to uh, affect them. It will be in double barriers. And if it leaks, it will shut down. The shutdown 
within five seconds and how much it can leak and then we do the controlled atmosphere through ventilation so these are the few of the items on the table based on the class rules because class rules exist as of today for every type of vessel any fuel you want to make it is there but you have to follow alternate design approach by the imo so this is a, a uh, uh, status as of today again it is not changing very fast so it is still there uh, for lng and methanol some information is there but for ammonia and hydrogen it is missing uh, from IMO side, I'm saying from IMO side because people ask us, do we have at the international standards? Answer is no, but for that we have a class rules to do that. And then uh, work is in progress. Uh, CCC committee in IMO is working on that. And then IGC code and IGF code are going to be revamped. The period is still between 2026 to 2028. So in that period, we will have uh, new items coming in. And in 2024, IGC code will be revised where we will b basically allow the toxic cargo to be used as a fuel because that also is a one question mark as of now. Ammonia as a fuel cannot be used because IGC code does not allow it as of today, but it has to be revised to include that. So it is hoped, it is hoped that we will have that in by 25, 26, things will happen that will allow engines to be uh, operated on the ship and that is a status. So IGF code has only LNG today, it does not have methanol, it doesn't have ammonia inside. So people have to do their own uh, projections or own uh, what you call uh, extensions to cover those similar risks. And where are the people to operate? That is a question mark because we are assuming, we are assuming that we will get the people ready. So we, in the end, we, we predict this ready for safe operation will be a big challenge for ship owners to plan. Number one, where are the shore staff who are ordering your alternative ships because they always sailed on oil as a fuel. Number two, the seafarers need to be guided by the shore staff who don't have experience themselves. So we have a big problem actually. So we are not even talking about that. Then number three, regulators, shipyards, and other people in the maritime logistic chains also have the same level of knowledge. So we have a big, big uh, work to be done for people to share knowledge about how to handle these alternative fuels. So these are the few of the items. I was almost there in the last, probably I'm missing one or two slides, but end of the day, it is about how to manage everything in a safe manner. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.